Three, two, one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming here on such a gorgeous day. Uh, I think the program will be worth it, though. Um, my name is Ron Miller. I'm um, the coordinator of the Learning Lab, and uh, we are the sponsors of this series. This is the third of three presentations on journalism uh, in uh, turbulent times. And um, today we have our own local publisher, um, Phil Camp. And we have a, a panel of Woodstock area uh, retired journalists who will discuss uh, the issues with Phil and with, with all of us. Um, Bob Hager, John Matthews, Karen Gilmore, and Sandy Gilmore. And I, th I think they may want to introduce themselves more later like you did last week. That was good. Um, I'm also here on behalf of Norman Williams Public Library uh, to uh, welcome you to the library. Uh, we have... Uh, wonderful programs coming up um, this coming Tuesday, uh, two programs. One will be on identity theft and another will be on financial planning. Um, it made me realize that if you have your identity stolen, you don't need to worry about financial <laughs> planning. So, uh, pick, take, you know, one of, pick one of those, but one's at two o'clock and the other's at six, is that right? Okay, um, and we have other programs here at the library and um, we're glad you're here. So, oh, and I want to thank the library staff who, uh, who set up uh, for us today. It's a lot of work putting all these chairs out and, and getting the water and you know, all that stuff. So thanks to, to Meg and Maeve and uh, anyone else help? Before I got here, I think the art committee actually helped in last night. The art committee. The art committee? Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, good. And they put up nice new yeah. artwork, too. Um, and finally, uh, thanks to um, our community television station, WCTV, Channel 8, um, for covering this and making it available to uh, more people in our community. So I'm going to turn it over to um, Bob Hager to introduce Phil, and uh, enjoy. Thanks, Ron. And uh, so they have, don't have to introduce themselves. I'll do that first. John Matthews, uh, who I first knew when he worked for the Washington Star, we were competitors in Washington when I was with the local station there, and then uh, later worked for us at NBC. Karen Gilmore, who worked for state papers in Davenport and St. Louis Post-Dispatch and Houston Chronicle. I left out the Deseret News, so I worked a lot of newspapers. The latter two following Sandy around or with Sandy. And then Sandy Gilmore worked for also CBS News. CBS Morning News. Yep, thank you, Scott. Yeah. <laughs> And Sandy Gilmore, who worked for uh, NBC and CBS as well. And I should introduce Dan Mashalaba <laughs> in the back row, who uh, wrote for the Wall Street Journal. So thanks for coming out with us. Uh, so anyway, Phil and I have, uh, I, knew, I knew these people for a decade or so in Washington before we all moved up here. But Phil I've known since, uh, since childhood, uh, from high school. He was two years ahead of me in high school. But we played football together. He was a running back. And uh, uh, then he went off to, uh, he was always aggressive, by the way. He, uh, <laughs> he was a go-getter. He was a, you could tell, he was going someplace. Uh, he, uh, he, he went to Benton Dryden, the editor of the Vermont Standard back then. Uh, and uh, as a sophomore in high school, got a job, was, uh, talked his way into a job as sports editor for 10 bucks a week. Uh, then he went to uh, Boston University and uh, uh, majored in communications, went to uh, master's at Boston University in communications and marketing. He was with Killington. He's always had these parallel careers of skiing and ski things and, uh, and newspapering. Uh, so he uh, worked for Killington for 10 years marketing and communications. And then I love this when uh, he started the Snow Chasers. First you were, you were head of an association of the New England ski areas, but that kind of morphed into, was it called Snow Chasers? Snow Country. Snow Country. Okay. They, that was an incredible operation that he started in his woodshed. And he, he had these announcers really, uh, and they all gathered there at like three in the morning or something to get the ski, ski conditions around the state and they had at their height, I think, uh, 1,200 uh, radio stations. Or, boy, it was incredible. And <laughs> we had a couple of them over at the house one time, and uh, they, they reported live 
uh, on the phone to radio stations, and uh, the guy'd be sipping cocktails with us or something. He'd say, "Excuse me." He'd go to the phone and he'd say, "And this is a classical music station." He'd say, "Well, uh, 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 Sugarbush has uh, 24 inches of bass and 12 inches of fresh powder." And so, and then, then a few minutes later, he'd take off. Sugarbush has 12 inches of powder. That'd be a rock station. The first one. <laughs> It was a wonderful operation. So, so Phil bought the paper uh, here at Woodstock, uh, where he had started uh, back in 1981. Has done a wonderful job with it, our, our hometown paper. Uh, and uh, what else should I say about the paper? Well, oh, four out of the last six years, they've been voted the top weekly uh, newspaper in, in New England. So that's quite, a, quite an honor. Uh, and, oh yeah, suffered through all those things. Uh, they're 166 years old, but you had a fire back in 1867, a flood in 1973, and then we all lived through Hurricane Irene when we were wiped out at their old uh, out place up in uh, West Woodstock, completely wiped out, and then last year's fire. So all you need now is pestilence, right? <laughs> <laughs> Be beware of locusts. <laughs> Um, and four years ago, Phil was named to the uh, uh, Newspaper Hall of Fame, so that again was quite an honor. So I give you Phil Camp. Are we wired now? Can you all hear? Yeah. Oh, great. I, I want to correct one thing in Bob's introduction. Uh, I'm not 166 years old. The newspaper is. So, okay. I feel it today. I've been sick. So, uh, thanks for coming today. It's uh, uh, some of you, many of you, have been here for all three of the sessions, including today. And uh, your stick-to-itiveness is appreciated. I hope that uh, between uh, uh, Vermont Digger and the Valley News and ourselves today, <clears throat> you'll understand there's a lot going on in the media business, uh, not which we like to think about too often, but we better think about it if we're going to stay in business. And we hope to share with you what your local community paper is going to try to do and is going to do, by golly, to, uh, to beat the odds. Um, this morning, I want, or this afternoon rather, uh, I want to walk you through a little bit of the background on the standard. I'd like to talk to you historically. Uh, I want to talk or touch on uh, the challenges that we're facing what we're doing about it. We're doing some stuff about it right now, and we have some plans to not only survive, but to come uh, back to life again in this new market uh, uh, climate. And perhaps, frankly, how you can help us, okay? Just to touch on history, not for long. It's a long history, and, and it's, a, it's an interesting history. Uh, I wish I had time, and you had time today to uh, discuss just the history. It's really great how we got here, the newspaper got here, and, and what it's, it's become, thanks to the support of the community. Well, in, in, in 81, as, as <clears throat> Bob said, I purchased the newspaper. Uh, in my view, at least, it was a very ineffective product. Maybe that's why I was able to buy it. Who's to know? Who's to know? <clears throat> it was deeply in the red, not just nonprofit a bull. It was, or unprofitable, uh, it was deeply in the red. The people that I went to help me buy it financially said, you're absolutely out of your mind. But uh, additionally, I should add, before I forget, it wasn't at all connected to people in the community. And that's what turned me on. I just, I've lived here all my life. And I just couldn't handle the fact that the local newspaper didn't give a hoot, it seemed, in all eight of its pages, by the way, back then, or sometimes 12. I just couldn't handle that. And that was the challenge, frankly. Let's get the community and the citizens connected. I hope we've begun to do that. So we breathed new life into it. We made it robust enough to, as Bob has indicated, uh, become at least Independently, they voted us the best uh, weekly newspaper in New England for four years in a row in the mid-2000s. 
Uh, and again, Bob, you should have written this for me. <laughs> you did more research than I did. But uh, we faced and survived Hurricane Irene. We all did, didn't we? And then, of course, it was last July's fire. But through it, we never missed a beat. And for 166 years, this newspaper has never not published in a single week. <laughs> and I, I got a little emotional about this. Next point. You know, a lot of people came to help us when we were down and out after Irene. People came out of the hills on foot. They couldn't drive. There was no road, right? Cox Road was done, gone. People came down to help us dig our computers out of the mud, helped us to try to salvage furniture. There wasn't any salvaging to be done. It was destroyed. Anything under five and a half feet up from the slab was done. But we had a call one day, of all things, asking permission to sponsor us to the Pulitzer Prize people for our courage and our service to the community. That, to me, gave us that added strength that we needed to do what might have been impossible. And for what it's worth, that person who made that nomination for a Pulitzer Prize sits with us here today. One of us did that, and we thank him very much. <coughs> I won't get quite so emotional on our current dilemma. Those are just facts of life I'll share with you. The current dilemma is often referred to in private company anyway as the death of local news. Well, think about it. Local news doesn't happen like it used to, not just in Woodstock or Woodstock area, but just about anywhere. Things have changed greatly. For all the reasons that you've probably heard or read about <coughs> or learned from the conversations that took place over the previous two sessions uh, that we've held here at, at Norman Williams, um, there is a death of local news. I'm here to tell you that even though the Vermont standard's a little different, we always act a little different maybe. That's not gonna happen here. It will not happen here. It's too important for democracy. It's too important for the wealth and welfare, health and welfare of our community and a bunch of other good reasons. This newspaper is gonna survive. We have a few ideas we'll share with you. And we're not magicians. The Vermont standard's a little different in this crisis. We don't have a problem of, of losing readers. In fact, our circulation is actually up. Up from the flood and up after the fire. But if you took note of local news produced by other media that we all have access to. I'm talking about radio, television, dailies, some weeklies. You'll have to know that the Vermont Standard only has one real problem. Not the will to go on, not the commitment to local communications and journalism, but to advertising revenue. That's the only thing that's holding us back. Our will is still there. Our hardworking staff is still there. You see, some of the daily papers don't have the same advantage that we do at the Standard, to be very frank about it. And I'm not picking on our friends that were here, what, last week from the Valley News. Wonderful people. But. The kind of information that you can get from the Rutland Herald, the Burlington Free Press, the Valley News, well, and the Boston Globe and the Herald, and 
New York Times and all, can also be found elsewhere on other media. And I don't just mean social media. I mean, you've got all kinds of ways you could pick up information on what's going on in, 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 in Washington or in Tokyo or East Podunk. But you can't get the same kind of local information as you can, about a community as you can with your own hometown paper. That's just the way it is. And we're blessed because of that reality. I have to put in a plug. Of the 10 or 12 communities that we serve in the Woodstock area, the Standard is the only news outlet which really focuses on the hometown, or hometowns, the 10 or 12 communities that we serve. By the way, when we started, we were focusing on three towns, and now we focus on 12. So life has gotten better. Because we're locally focused, all of the information is gathered here and it's distributed here. We're fortunate that we live in a community and in a region where we don't have to compete or be competed with, or you don't have to worry about, well, can I get it on the local radio station? Can I get it on the local television station? Oh, maybe it's on the web. We don't do all the things we'd like to do and the things that we do, but uh, we do a fairly good job. And as you'll hear in a few minutes, with your help, we can do even better. We'd like to do more, but somehow we've got to improve that problem that we have of advertising revenue. You know, this is not a, a plug, or not it is, a, a kick. <laughs> Any, uh, at the Herald or the Valley News or any, anybody of that sort. Excuse me. But <clears throat> let's face it. They have the same problems we do. Ours are smaller. But our followers are stronger. We have more people that will come to our cause or rally and, and offer suggestions and maybe even help us with our finances. Who knows? We're grateful that the library has made this available. I wish we could do more like this. Not just limit it to, to we media related companies, but what a great learning opportunity to have this library in our town or towns providing these kinds of services. I'm going to get criticized for this, but I have to compare it. When Bob and I were buddies in high school, I won't tell that story. No. <laughs> uh, I will tell one story. I was sitting in chemistry class one day. <clears throat> ah, to live in a small town. And pretty soon everybody started, who was the who was the uh, teacher of? Bankaira? No, no, of chemistry. chemistry. Anyway, pretty soon he was wondering why all the eyes were looking out the, do the window. Leslie McDonald. Les McDonald, okay? <laughs> he was <laughs> pretty upset that he was losing the class. He didn't know how to get them back together. And we finally all, without permission, stood up and went to the window. <laughs> the window? There was no fire next door. It was Bob Hager and Francis Howard floating down the Atacuichi in the spring. They'd skip school <laughs> on a beautiful day like today. I don't, I, I won't tell anymore. <laughs> do we have a plan to survive? Of course we do. First of all, we're stubborn. Second of all, we're committed. And third of all, we're really working hard to try and fight our way out of this dilemma. As small as we are, as underfunded as we are, we know we can win. 
Here are some of the things we're going to do. And by the way, I won't pause with a mention of each one and say, well, for here, there's there and there. And there. But come up afterwards, after we've had a good discussion, huh? and take a look at some of these new things that you've never seen the standard do before. All in the last six weeks, OK? We aren't the old Vermont standard anymore. In certain ways, I hope we are. But we aren't just that, that sheet of paper. We're magazines, and we're websites, and we're doing lots of interesting things. And I don't think that we've done a very good job of marketing that, that is making you aware of what we're doing. This is a start today. How many people, and some people don't like it, by the way, but boy, it works when you've got an advertising revenue problem, OK? <clears throat> How many people saw the two different issues we put out that had what we call the wraparound. It was the regular paper and wrapped around the front section, all the back and half the front, and by the way, printed on the inside as well. How many people saw that? I'm not going to take a s <laughs> I hope most of you liked it. I loved it for a couple of reasons. Somebody paid for it. <laughs> And it's not cheap. But you know that when the first one hit the stands, our phone began to ring. He said, hey, why didn't you tell me about this? We have two of them standing. And, and, and I think it's, it's not improper to say, those are $1,500 and worth every penny. Why? Because you dominate the front section. And the front section could be the most expensive part of the newspaper in any newspaper. OK? People, and we won't do it every week. I get claustrophobic as well. OK? But that new little gimmick, not gimmick really, but new little service that we've come up with can improve a company that makes less than a half million dollars a year. Fifty to sixty thousand dollars that it badly, desperately needs today, just by trying something different. And then, did you notice this week? There's another new idea, like a post-it. Did anybody notice that? A couple did. We didn't originate this idea. It's an idea that we heard about on a couple of dailies, in fact, not weeklies. When they're printing the front section, including page one, presses today can also print a post-it, a removable post-it. That post-it gets slapped on the page. And I got to tell you, if there's any newspaper you read today, whether it's the New York Times or the Boston Globe or the Vermont Standard, if, if you see something sitting on page one and it has an appealing question to ask or, or, or an offer to make, you're probably going to pick up this thing and take a look at it. You don't have the same reaction to thumbing through the pages and saying, oh, that's a nice ad. Hopefully they do. It's different. We're doing it. We're doing it. And those are not going to cost that kind of money. I know. It's just a little bit of something new and different. And it's, uh, it's going to help us to overcome our financial uh, dilemma. Specialty publications. I'm going to tell you something. There are some great uh, exceptions to this when I say that weekly newspapers really don't get into the specialty publication business that much, if at all. There are exceptions. Anybody here read the store, uh, read the store reporter? Do you receive that at all or occasionally? Or? They literally make more money. That little weekly newspaper company whose weekly circulation is approximately the same of the Vermont standards. They make more money 
on their specialty publications than they make in their newspaper the entire year. Destination Vermont. I won't bore you with examples of all these new, new thoughts, ways to bail out of the dilemma. Destination Vermont, we've been putting it out for almost 15 years on newsprint. And with the exception of the back and front cover, or covers, all black and white, all newsprint. This is all on slick magazine stock. It's all in four color process. And I had to beg to find a couple samples left after we put the window one out because they, can, they went off the stands, they're free, went off the stands, not overnight, but it seemed like overnight. By just converting this from a newsprint, kind of bland, newsprint type special publication, we can improve and we put out three a year, by the way. We used to put out two. This year we started with this third edition. We can put another $50,000 in the, in the kitty to help solve our dilemma. And there are a couple of suggestions up here. I'm not going to detail them here. I think you're getting the message that we're going to use creativity and hard work. We've always used hard work, but that was to stay alive. And now that we're reaching for, for the surface because we're underwater, we've got to do some new things. There are a lot of good, exception, uh, good examples of that up here, I hope. <clears throat> have you noticed our new website? I'm not embarrassed if you haven't seen it. But it's different. Real, everybody has a website. The problem with newspaper websites, not all of them, but the problem with newspaper websites is, I call them cookie cutter websites. They're all the same. And they're often difficult to navigate. They often don't have the right kind of information on, for content. I think we've done a major breakthrough on our website. We've changed the name. It's not, uh, it's not the Vermont Standard website, which we thought was really cool about seven years ago when we had our first website. But we were copycats. We thought, well, if newspapers are going to do it, we'll do it. We're calling it Vermont Standard This Week. Why This Week? Well, on a website which heretofore would take stories that also ran in the newspaper and say, well, we've got a website, let's stick it on that. Maybe a few people will read it. Instead, our new website puts information in the air for you to receive every single day when it happens. We're a seven day a week publication, as it were, by way of our website. You must do yourself a favor. Look at it. Be critical of it. Let us know where it's hard to, uh, to, to work, uh, to, to get the information. Tell us what kind of information you'd like to see on it that isn't there now. But we've gone from a cookie cutter website <clears throat> which made roughly 250 bucks a week. Well, paid for the paper, you know. To one that's coming out seven days a week, within minutes of when there's an issue that's worth airing. Remember when they had the, um, the horrible, near disastrous accident opposite the white, uh, white cottage? on Route 4, do, do, do you remember that? some of you? We didn't have the new website then. We huffed and we puffed and we did this. We were there. 
The minute the squawker went off on the editor's desk, we dispatched a photographer and a reporter. We covered it. <laughs> we covered it so well that the attorney representing the, uh, the plaintiff asked for a copy of all of our photographs. Nobody else got there like we did. It's not getting there and capturing the information that counts. That does help. But it's getting it out to the public. Now we can do it same day, almost same hour. Check out the website. Because the Vermont standard this week is no comparison to what the Vermont standard website dot com used to be. Another way we're just trying to overcome the, the dilemma that we're in. <clears throat> How many went on time? Mm -hmm. Huh? Okay. Small crowd with you, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, <clears throat> some of you will remember, well, all of you will remember, <clears throat> pardon me, the, uh, uh, the Wassel Parade, of course. And I'm not exaggerating. Uh, I think I've been to all but two of them that have been held, and how many have been? More than 25 of them. And I'd usually pick my favorite spot, and I'd have my camera over my shoulder, and I'd like to shoot. And more and more people, over the years, <clears throat> people would come up and say, do you live around here? Well, yeah, I do. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, where is the Congregational Church? I said, well, it's right down on Elm Street. Where are you from? Oh, I'm from Tappahannock or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, Virginia. And I said, well, listen, you go down here, you, you go by Gillingham's, and then, because they were going to go to the a cappella choir performance. They didn't know how to get there. And the only thing we as a community were doing for years and years was mimeographing a two sided, eight and a half by 14 sheet of paper that listed when events were going to be held. I couldn't handle that for another year, because people would come up and say, well, I know I can't get into the Woodstock Inn because it's crowded, and it looks like it might be expensive. Is there any place I could feed my two kids? And you try to give them some advice and not do your good friends at the Inn Inn, okay? Or they might ask some personal questions about where can I cash a check or where can my two kids go to, you know? And I said, you know what? There has to be an app that can do this. And I didn't know how to invent an app. I don't know how to turn my computer on and off correctly. <clears throat> but I found somebody. And we came up with the app, uh, the, the Wassel app. <clears throat> we hit the street. We activated the, the, the app <clears throat> on Wednesday the best we could do. We had sent to a, uh, an organization in, um, in California to have them make up 5,000 uh, little uh, business card sized handouts. And we were around and we populated the stores and B&Bs and they were free, you know, and, and how you get the free app. It was a free app because we convinced Mascoma Bank to help us out. And we made a little bit of money. But more than that, we provided something that had not been done before, getting into digital advertising ourselves. OK, well, wait till the next time you see what we're going to do. I hope the first one, I hope it's half as successful as the first one, because from Wednesday through Sunday, from Wednesday through Sunday, that app was downloaded, downloaded over 4,400 times. Did anybody ever use that app? You did. Well, there are a lot of good reasons to have those sorts of things in our community, especially with visitors who are, who are just here at our invitation. They don't know the town the way we do. And oh, by the way, if you own a local shop and you happen to put an offer of some sort on there as a little ad, 
it's not going to hurt your business either. So anyway, getting into digital advertising more aggressively than we have in the past is one of the things that we're going to, uh, to do our best to, uh, to expand. Uh, <clears throat> pardon me. Both, uh, well, aims sometimes just at the community, but we're really going to try to help uh, and form and direct and assist the visitor market. We get thousands and thousands of people here, and we kind of assume they'll figure it out. And I'm not knocking the things we do do. We just aren't doing enough. We, the community, we just aren't doing enough, that's all. We can make it easier. We can be, make it more enjoyable for people to come and visit and be helped to discover what you and I know is a very special experience. <clears throat> How can you help? There are so many things I wanted to talk about, but I get all wrapped up. My poor wife is sitting here having a fit. She did all the typing for this thing. She said, Phil, that's not exactly what you wrote that I typed, <laughs> you know? And I, I'm saying, you're absolutely right, dear. And you knew I was going to do this. <laughs> I can't help it. I've lived here 83 years. I love this place. And I just can't. He's always been a great talker. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. I, like you, I love and respect this community. And I just want to make it more enjoyable, more accessible, more rememberable than it already is. You know, the first day that I walked into the standard office after I was the owner, that was almost 39 years ago. I brought a mirror with me. <clears throat> and I plopped it down on my desk. It also washed away in the flood and it broke my heart because this little mirror helped me to say, remind myself. And when people say, what's this mirror doing on your desk, Phil? It was about that big. Are you looking at yourself every day and admiring yourself? Or are you scolding yourself if you did something wrong or whatever? And I said, no, I'm putting it there to remind me who we are. We are nothing. The standard is nothing more than a mirror that it holds up to the community so that the people who live here can see themselves, warts and all. We aren't a perfect society. No community in America or the world probably is. But if we try to help people see who we are and what goes on around here that's worth preserving, that's worth expanding, that's worth improving, we've done a service to ourselves and to everybody that ever comes in contact with this community. Well, it was a sad day when that mirror went down the river. But I haven't started uh, any bad habits, I hope. We always, at the standard, say, how can we help that organization? Listen, we were nonprofit, not by choice, a long time before becoming nonprofit was a popular thing for some newspapers to do in order to save their bacon. That feeling, that attitude, we all should help that to prevail. We have to somehow find ways to, to appeal to people to understand we can help each other. Look what happened with Irene. Have you ever felt the warmth like that? Probably you have somewhere. But remember the, the warmth that we all felt about helping somebody who needed help. I remember when fellow from the Weather Channel showed up at the, at the Standard uh, after the flood was about 48, years, uh, 48 hours old. He said, and I used to serve him when I was in the ski business, and he said, Camp, is that you? And I said, Cantori, is that you? And he said to me, he said, well, what, what's your vision of what, what should happen? I said, well, the first thing I'd like to do 
is see them get the water back on so we could remove the 52 porta potties in the park. I, I think some of the basic needs that we, human needs that we have ought to be restored. I said, but they, the next thing we need to do is we need to sit down and talk to ourselves about and applaud ourselves for what we've accomplished. And we should say to ourselves, there are only two things this community needs, in addition to a good newspaper, and that's vision and leadership. Think about it. Vision and leadership. That's what makes our, our community, has made it great, and can make it further great. Okay, Bob, I'm through. Almost, right. almost. <laughs> I gotta ask for some help. So, how can you help? We need help. All newspapers need help. But right now, I'm looking out for us. Okay? The 10 people, that bring you the standard and all these new things. Read us regularly. If you don't already. Be willing to be critical of us. Be willing to suggest how we can do a better job. Nobody died and left me in charge of how people should think and act in this community. And I can't, with only one reporter, who's over there, <laughs> Neil can't be all places all the time. We don't know when events are happening. We don't know that Mr. Jones's house burned down until the fire department tells us. Let us know, feed us information. We can't handle it all at the same time, but the more we know about what life is like, what the needs are in the community, the more we can try to share it with other people. The second thing is, advertise with us, or at least urge others to advertise with us. Because remember, that's where we're so vulnerable right now. Advertising in every community, in every newspaper, has gone away at 10 to 20% per year, nationally. We're all in trouble. We've got to find a way to get people to support the newspaper, even though we have all these new things that inform people and excite people and help people. The third thing is to support our new and upcoming initiatives so that they can gain traction when they come out, when they're first on the market. We're not asking you to buy everything. We're asking you to talk it up. Say, have you tried the new such and such? I tried it and it's great, if you think it's great. <laughs> it needs, these need to get traction. We're launching some new products starting in a couple of weeks. Well, tell us what's wrong with them, of course, and we'll try to make some changes if they deserve it. But in the meantime, talking it up gets people to also try it. And if they try it, it helps our revenue. I'm repeating myself a bit when I say, when you feel something should be covered and it's not being covered, let us know. And if 12 of you in this room call me Monday morning and say, I got an idea what you should be doing, we can probably handle a couple of them. <laughs> we can't do it all at once, you know that. We don't have all the eyes and ears that collectively we do in this room and beyond. Let us know if something needs to be covered. And by the way, let us know when we're, not, we're providing something to the public that doesn't make a lot of sense. Maybe we should stop it. And yes, you can consider partnering with us as a donor or underwriter at some level. We'll talk about that another time. Why? Why help us? Because if a community values its newspaper for local journalism that it provides, its ability to promote community conversations and connections, its ability to support local businesses and local organizations, then that community needs to help sustain it. 
It's as simple as that. Please remember this. This is your community newspaper. It's not mine. But I can't do it alone. Thank you. We're going to try this without microphones, because we decided the microphone is too awkward. But let us know if you can't hear, especially in back. John? Yeah, I think uh, in the Pulitzer Prize competition, I think the standard was, was there, but unfortunately, it had a tropical storm while in New Orleans they had a full-blown hurricane. <laughs> and then New Orleans paper won. But I, I think the uh, standard story was a great story. And uh, uh, a, a weekly competing against a, a daily is not too easy. Can I mention your name? May I mention your name? Sure. It was our friend sitting to my left that made the nomination. Thank you. Great story that had to be uh, had to be done. Now you, you said something that surprised me. Uh, you are a nonprofit. No, no, you're not profit. No, well, we're not profit. <laughs> no, but frankly, uh, we've been exploring. Uh, we've been exploring. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, we've been exploring. The uh, other newspapers have tried this, and uh, some have succeeded, and I'm learning. Uh, that there are different ways to do it. And currently, uh, and I've been asked by the, the, the helpers or the people helping us uh, not to identify them, but we've been offered and are using some legal advice right now that we could never afford, right? To show us how we be could become nonprofit. Look, there's public radio, there's public television, there is a, a Vermont Digger. Why not the Vermont Standard? I never bought the Standard to make a lot of money, John. But I want to see it survive. So if we have to uh, give up, technically give up the ownership and uh, exclusive direction of it in order to, uh, to appeal for and, and receive uh, uh, donations, we'll do it. Um. Well, first of all, I, I want to congratulate you on the Vermont Standard Weekly because the other day when the Lincoln Bridge got closed down because of a truck, um, we actually were able to find something. Went to the Vermont Standard Weekly website and there it was, some information. And one of the most frustrating things about Irene for us we had not moved here full time yet at that point, but we happened to be here when it struck. And uh, we could not find out any information except from a woman who had, who was running a sort of a, a, a little, it wasn't a website, but she was answering questions and I can't even remember her name, but anyway. Uh, so I'd like to congratulate you on that, but I also, wonder who is Dan Cotter, uh, what is his role, and um, does he have a financial stake in the paper, and can, when can he come and talk to us too? He is in Chicago today. Uh, this will take a, a minute or two, not a long story, but Dan Cotter has become a dear friend of mine. He is one of the most skilled people in today's newspaper world, I think. Um, I'm not name dropping, but he, uh, he was the aide de camp or the right hand guy to Mr. Pulitzer for 19 years. He, he earned his spurs, he learned uh, a lot about the profession, um, but I didn't know him then. Uh, I sit on the board of the New England Newspaper and Press Association, and uh, so I go to directors meetings and that sort of thing down there. And, have for a long time. And I met Dan when he was the executive director of NEMPA. Uh, Gatehouse Publications, which is a huge, if, if you consider the number of properties, 
uh, weekly and, and daily newspapers, <clears throat> uh, stole him away at a tremendous salary, and he became the head of, of uh, training, a advertising training for them. And frankly, uh, I hope I'm not bad-mouthing by saying this, but he doesn't dig going up through several strata of executives and <laughs> having a great idea here, but everybody signing on and having to write reports, and, and he just couldn't take the, the political environment that he found himself in. And uh, he and I just happened to be, uh, he was not at Nempathed, he and I had been starting a, a series of, oh, maybe quarterly get-togethers at uh, a little restaurant and grill down in, in uh, the Wayland area, which was near the office of Nempa. And we just, we, we were on the same wavelength. And uh, I would ask him for advice, and honest to goodness, you couldn't pay enough to get a consultant to tell you all the things I could learn. And one day, we were sitting there, and, oh, by the way, I had invited him to come up here to Wassel. And uh, that's another whole story, and we really don't have time for that. I know about But <laughs> he was just taken by Woodstock. Well, great. I, I felt great uh, about that. And so we were sitting at lunch at this little bar and grill, and he said, you know what I'm thinking? I said, I think I do. I know this sounds contrived, but the two men were sitting there talking to each other, and we took the piece of paper from the table and ruined the back of it, and I said, okay, what are you thinking? And he held it up, and I held my up, mine up, and we both said, let's work together. That's how it all happened. We had so much synergy. We had so much energy. We had so much desire to do some things differently that he became about, uh, well, he became a consultant for us. Oh, a year and a quarter, a year and a half ago. And then he, um, he's been on board as our publisher. I reneged, you know, I resigned from that level. There was nobody else around to be publisher and president, so that was me for a while, right? But um, he's our publisher. And uh, very honestly, uh, he doesn't need training, but I'll use the expression, I'm training him to be my first, my, my replacement. Your successor someday. Yeah. Um, does but not right away. Does he have, okay. Good. Good story. Does he have a uh, financial interest in the paper at this point? No, he does not. Okay. And, uh, I, I'm the only owner of the what paper. What is his role? Does he consult from Chicago, or how often no. does he come here? Uh, he comes on from, uh, he lived in, in uh, the uh, dedham Whalum area when he and I spent time together, and he sold that, not knowing that we were going to actually join hands up here, uh, went, went back to his roots and his wife's roots, uh, where he raised his six or seven kids and all that sort of thing, uh, went back to Chicago bought a townhouse or a condominium there. Then he also came to West Windsor and bought a similar property, but a smaller property. He lives here three weeks, goes home to Chicago for a week, then returns for another three weeks at the Standard. Okay, thank you. But while he's in Chicago, He's always on the phone, or always on the website, or whatever. Yeah. Well, just okay. Uh, to follow up on that, then organizationally, I wonder, could you tell us how are things organized? We know you've got a great business reporter; she's right here. It's a great column. But yeah, it is. You have. Why don't you pay him? <laughs> I hope but, you pay her well. How big is the staff? How many reporters? Who's the editor? What's the what's the process? You, you mentioned you have one reporter. But can you tell us a little more about the staff and the news gathering process that you employ? I'd be happy to answer that question. We're evolving a slightly different format, but 
we have two people in the newsroom. We have a, a editor and a backup. I'm just using generic terms here. Uh, Virginia, <coughs> Virginia, and um, and Christian. Then um, in sales, we only have two people. So that's what four. We have a uh, accountant, uh, business manager, single person who's part time. We have a person who coordinates uh, circulation and reception. We're all multitask there, by the way. Um, who's new with us, by the way? And um, let's see, somebody help. Oh, Lisa. Lisa does 99.9% uh, of, of all the um, all the graphics. She literally sets up every single page in that newspaper, and also, in addition, does the specialty publications. Um, she does it all herself. We don't print at the Valley News anymore, I might add. Uh, we found ways to speed up our delivery and reduce our costs by over 30% by printing in uh, at the north of Boston. Uh, what is that, Attleboro or where is Andover. that? Andover. 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 Yeah. So what have I missed now, Mary Lee? Reporters. Reporters. Oh, I've got Neil. <laughs> Thanks, Neil. <laughs> Neil goes everywhere. I think we're going to buy him a Winnebago so that he can give up wherever he lives in the Claremont area. And Neil's relatively new to us, by the way, and thank God for that. And by the way, uh, we're such a small staff and multitask the way we do that Lisa Wright, the lady I just spoke about, who does all of the graphics, had never had in 20 something years a full week's vacation. She'd take a day here and a day there, and, a day, and that shouldn't happen. That shouldn't happen. Well, it happens that Neil comes from an interesting newspaper background and graphics background. And so we experimented. How long? A month ago, was it? Or? I started in January. So in the current year, anyway. Uh, and Neil can pretty much cover her so that she can finally get out of Dodge for a full week or if she had a family crisis of some sort. Okay, now, oh, then I got loudmouth myself. John. Well, I'll get to John. But Phil, I see other bylines in there. Heather Stella, I saw it today, or on the Thursday, others. Oh, are these I'll get to those. Or are these freelancers or what? Or? Yeah, they're freelancers. 80% or more of the content of the paper, on top of the news content, comes from freelancers. You know, and freelancers, by law, don't have to say, yeah, I'll take that job. They say, no, I'm busy that day because they don't like the story or whatever reason. So at least 80% of the content of the newspaper, we have to go. We don't have a staff photographer. We don't have a staff writer, per se, that we can plan on uh, full time, except for pushing Neil to do the impossible. How many does that come to? It should come to 10. Because you got myself and Dan Cotter and, and Mary Lee. So it's about 10 people. And a couple to three of those are part time. That took a long time, I'm sorry. Okay. Let's throw it open to the audience. Yes, please. Okay. Yeah. Uh, first of all, my name is Nan. And I love your paper. I'm, I always get it every week. <coughs> read it cover to cover. And uh, <coughs> I don't know what I do without it, and I just love newspapers. And I've also written for the paper, and I was very, very excited to right. see my name in print, and so I, that was one of those joys that you never forget. But, and, um, and I had a couple of questions. The first one is, uh, because this to me is the most important one, and although people tell me it's not, um, in terms of copy editing, 
Um, there are enormous numbers of mistakes in your paper. Right. And, um, and I know Margaret Edwards at one point offered to be your copy editor for free. And somebody turned it down. I would like to offer myself, or we need to get somebody. It's, it's extremely distracting, I find, mm -hmm. to have to figure out all these mistakes. Certain, certain uh, colonists don't have any mistakes. They edit themselves, it seems like. Others just let it go and are just extraordinarily careless. And I think what bothers me about that is that carelessness is a demoralizing thing to watch. And I love your paper so much, I don't want to see that. And so I, if there's some way we can help to stop that, I would be very grateful. And I'd be willing to help myself. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very close, critical reader myself, as you can gather. So I, I'll help if you like. And if I ever retire, I'll retire a happy man when I can solve that problem. We used to have a system, and we gave it up after the flood, but <clears throat> where we would pass every story around before it was set to four people, none of which, including myself, were qualified for one reason or another to be, you know, to edit. That's, uh, and we picked up a lot of the stuff, dates and names of people, that sort of thing. It's one of my, it's one of the things that haunts me the most. And I can't remember the, the gentleman's name that you mentioned that offered his help for free. Well, Margaret Edwards. Oh, well, Margaret Edwards. <laughs> she's my next door neighbor. Well, she told me that she offered to be your copy editor and you just, Said poo -poo. <laughs> well, they didn't talk to the boss. <laughs> uh, I, no, no, I, I would not have done that, especially since my neighbor, you know. Uh, no, we recognize that. We're not going to duck things, uh, issues like that. We have a problem there. Yes, Molly. Well, I know I'd offer myself too because I used to do proofreading, so it's a thought. I mentioned it once or twice, and you said, okay, I'll think about it. But it is, uh, I don't know if you're do it. Pardon me? It's not that first four hours, obviously. I guess not. I mean, I guess not. That's what I gathered, but I did do it at the times, and these weeks, so I'm there for you. I'm going to ask a favor of both you ladies, and I hope there are a couple more that have ideas like this. Drop me a, drop me a note. I'm 83 and I forget things too much. All right. Just send it uh, or give me a call at the office. I appreciate that greatly. Peggy. Uh, Peggy. Peggy. Oh, hi. Um, we love your paper. And But one thing I wondered, just as, as a marketing thing, um, does every room in the Woodstock Inn get a copy of the paper? Yes, they do. Do. And is the Vermont Standard Weekly this week? Is that um, the, the Vermont is there what? is there closed circuit TV for uh, the inn? And so you know, on the menu it might say local or something that you could have. I, I, I don't understand your question. Well, if you are. Uh, a guest of the inn, and, yeah. and, and by the way, I, I use the inn because it is sort of the economic engine here. But if you if you are looking at TV, but then you want to just check kind of a local news and local advertising and local, is there a way that it goes through that you can go through the Vermont Standard and be on a menu in each room? That's a good idea. That's a good idea. As part of your I like your choice per arm. <laughs> I don't know how to do it. No, no. I'm telling you. This is, what's a focus group all about? Or what's a community coming together and, and advising its, its newspaper how it could do a better job? This is great. We should do this once a month. <laughs> I, I think so, too. I, Go over I have here. two questions. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, first is, how are you staffing your breaking news that goes on the web? How do you get a reporter out to these places and then cover the news very quickly and get it out online? How are you doing that? Let me repeat that. I have a hearing problem. Okay. And I want to be sure. Are you saying, how do we cover something that's considered breaking news? Yeah, right. I mean, how do we find the staff? Yeah, for the web. For the instant web. Right. To get it's it a minor there. miracle. It's a minor miracle. Because I said earlier that uh, at least 80% of the content of the paper is by, not volunteers, but by paid uh, freelancers. Well, we have a sheet of uh, shooters, uh, photographers, shooters, 
and we have a sheet of people that can write a decent column, whether they catch the typos or not, I don't know, but, uh, and we just start calling. And some of them, there's a young man up at uh, 506 on the river who's been doing some shooting and writing for us. And he's, I won't say hungry, that's not a nice way to put it. He's anxious to affiliate with us. So I start with those, or the editor starts with those, and then we work down to sending Mary Lee and I out to shoot a picture if they're desperate. Uh, we don't have a, a good backup plan other than we got a sheet of, of potential reporters and a sheet of potential uh, photographers. Do you send your reporter out? Or, or I'm sorry, you, sir? Do you ever send your reporter out to cover those well, breaking news stories? Or one of course, on a weekend, you, you wouldn't probably do it. Uh, yes, yes. That's part of the 20%, if you follow me. We can't possibly uh, have a large, under current circumstances, financially, uh, hire a, a large enough staff to have them wait for the, the bell to go off. Uh, you know, when I was a kid in college, I, I worked for the Globe and the Herald a couple of times. You know, it was great and exciting. They sent me out to do the scuffiest jobs. You know. And all they wanted me to do is snap a picture that would hold up in court or something. But uh, we don't have any backup, any backup uh, on staff. Neil would jump. If Neil is there and he's not in the middle of, of deadline on a Wednesday, there's a guy that will just take off. But it's all chance. I'm sorry, but pretty simple. Question I have a second question. Oh, but, oh, Dan's got one more. He has a second. Uh, um, and look, it seems that uh, landlords, some distant, who are in New York or other places, play a big part in the rise and fall of local businesses on Main Street mm -hmm. and on Elm Street. Has the paper done a story introducing mm -hmm. these landlords and telling the readers who these guys are and where are they and do they ever even visit Woodstock? Do they know how important this community is and if they're jacking up the rates and letting stores sit there vacant, maybe we ought to know who these guys are. We've read it from one of those guys, as you know, I believe. Um, the folks that own the property, the real estate, that burned down. By the way, we didn't burn it down just so we could get a different office. Uh, somebody else decided to be an arsonist. Um, uh, I'm going to answer this, but I really hope you won't misunderstand my intention. <clears throat> a newspaper has to be a little brave. It has to take chances to capture good, honest, solid news. Okay? And as, as slow as we are to be that type of person or in, in covering a, a potentially unpopular story in terms of the recipient on the other end, we have an additional problem. We're conditioned in Woodstock to just don't worry. We'll take care of it. And I'm not pointing fingers at any level of, of local government, but it's hard to get an agency of government to say, yeah, you're right, we got a problem. People are talking about it. They don't support us in that. They just talk about it. So we've got to go to all the work to, to, to gather that, uh, that information ourselves. And I don't know if we're skilled enough or maybe we're just not tough enough. Uh, I th am I beginning to answer it? It's a shame, not a shame, it's, it's unfortunate that we can't deal with tough questions more often. Write us a note. Here's a way to start the process, possibly. Letters to the editor in weekly newspapers are one of the four most widely read parts of the newspaper Unless you're as old as me, and that would be the obituaries. <laughs> okay? Seriously, <clears throat> if your letter or someone here 
said the kinds of things that you've just shared with this group, it'll get read. And maybe somebody else will say, well, they can do it, I can do it. Yeah. There was a question over here, I don't know if you still... <laughs> have you considered raising the price of the newspaper? <clears throat> yes, we have. Um, <clears throat> When I bought the newspaper, it was 60 cents a copy. And I took my life in my hands. Because I had some stockholder investors at that point. Today, I can only look to myself in the mirror <clears throat> for making mistakes or celebrating success. But uh, we were at 75 cents. And I said, gee whiz, 75 cents. It cost us 75 cents. You're not making any money at 75 cents. So what I did is, and I don't drink coffee that much, but I did that day, or those days. I went around to every conceivable place that sold coffee, a cup of coffee. And I wanted, and I had a little pad of paper in my pocket. And I said, how much would a cup of coffee cost? All right? Well, if you went to a really fine restaurant, you could be paying two dollars and fifty cents, but I never paid less than a buck, less than a dollar. Went back to the office. We raised it to a buck, <laughs> and I wrote an editorial, not a long one. I like to write two or three subjects to an editorial, and I just said, "Look, if you can afford a dollar for a good cup of coffee, you can afford to buy the Standard for a dollar." And I haven't had the courage to go to a dollar and a quarter. What's it cost to buy the, the Boston Globe for a day now? Somebody can help me here, but it's two or three dollars? Yeah. Valley News is a bunch of things. How I'm much is it? how cheap it is. And Valley News is a dollar a quarter, like Molly said. It just seems like, I think people would, if you went to dollar fifty, I think people would buy it. Yeah. Two dollars yeah. even. Yeah. It's just once a week yeah. you're buying it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I agree. I agree. Absolutely. Let's go to Karen. There's a question. Oh, it's actually it's kind of not a question, but it is. Um, I don't. It, it has to do with advertising, and I've always been on the news side, so I am no expert on this. But I, ha in my reading and preparation for these uh, classes. <coughs> I learned that not only it, that what you said is true, advertising has plummeted at most newspapers. Um, however, part of the problem is that all national, all advertising is national these days. And so when you're in Chicago and you call McDonald's or whatever and say, uh, can you buy an ad in the Tribune? They'll say, oh, contact our national office. Yeah. But here, we do not have national stores. It's one of the beauty of, beauties of Woodstock, in my opinion, anyway. And so I'm wondering um, what the situation is. Are you just not charging enough? Or uh, <laughs> are you charge as much as, as the merchants will pay? Or um, what exactly is the problem with advertising? Or the, or the people are turning it down? I'll tell you, use the word exactly. I was ready to answer the question. I can't okay, even... in that case, I'll, I'll return no, to no, the word I just exactly. Because <laughs> uh, it is a... You design. know what? We made a mistake about probably 15 years ago. We owned the market, if you know what I mean by yeah, that. I, I mean, we didn't have a stranglehold on the market. Right. I mean, be, but our rates were reasonable. Our circulation was uh, was... Solid, our pass along, yeah, you know, we had 3.1 readers for every copy of the paper. Pretty good. But we allowed, we didn't encourage it, but we allowed our sale, I can say it, they don't work for us anymore, but not for that reason. We allowed our salespeople to go out and make deals. And you know what, when you're on commission, and deadline hour or day is getting closer. You say, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. They weren't authorized to do this. But they did. And I didn't know it to start with, or I would have probably pushed back. 
But when they finally found out about it and tried to lure the boom and say, you call and ask if you can do that, uh, I never had that two-way conversation with the salespeople. Big mistake. Big mistake. So now how is it handled? You want to make a deal? If you're a salesperson, you can basically say, um, let's take this, um, this wrap that we just did uh, with that auto company. Auto companies. Can I get a deal for you? <laughs> Come in and kick the tires and I'll really give you a deal. They wanted to cut us to ribbons. And fortunately, the person on our staff said, no, I've got a check with the office. And maybe we carved 5% out of it. Well, let me tell you, when you're trying to launch a new product, to only make 95 cents on a dollar instead of zero cents on a dollar, we did it. I'll do it again, too. I know, but you know what? I'm one of the few who doesn't love the rap because it delays my getting to the front page. <laughs> but you know, I, but, but the principle covers all advertising. Somebody might say, well, I ran the ad last week. Well, we didn't have a two-for-one rate back then. We keep the questions short uh -huh. and answers short. Then we can get two or three in here. Okay. So the remaining, uh, but Molly, you have another one. I'm going to just start a really quick one. Um, a big money maker for the Valley News are the transaction ads. Are what? Transaction ads, everybody knows those are the little box ads. I used to be a rep for the Valley News. The little box ads on the back. back and the every back. bit helps. And I raised the paper to dollar twenty-five. But that's but uh, why you don't use transaction ads? Because Rich Wallace said it was a big money maker for them. What are they? Well, I'm going to tell you. Do you ever look at the back of the paper yeah. and you oh, see yeah. the little box ads? Yeah. Oh, sure. Come see someone, so to yeah. speak. Uh -huh. Or you can have a little ad. Man, it can be any diff different size. And you have a rate card like Newsweek has. Here are your rates. There's no deals. It's spelled out. People will pay it if they see that's the deal. But go small, and then even that, that adds to the whole profit. Hmm. Number two. By story. the way, I can't answer the question that you've asked. Why don't we? Yeah, so I don't know. I think it'd be a great idea, so and I've said it to Jim, and he, uh, your ad person. But I think transaction ads would be really helpful. And number, yeah, transaction. And I'll just bring you a sheet from the Valley News and show it to you. You were going to add something? Pardon me. Oh, the second one is um, in my youth. I was a stringer, you know, for when I lived in Cleveland, my hometown. But stringers can be something that goes out. It's a see something happening, has an idea. Uh, they can tell the paper about it. One of your writers can write it. But a stringer goes out, and they might interview about his question about uh, this landlord who has an empty building for three years, and he's still at writing off a profit, but he's not renting any of these empty buildings. That's an interesting story. Or just having somebody go out with an idea. They can write it up or tell it to one of your journalists to write it, or some journalism student in town who might not want to do it for the summer. Or just a thought. And they're stringers. And they're idea people who will go out and get stories. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Sandy, a quick question, Phil. Why, why do we not know who lit the fire? I'm going Why do we not know who lit the fire? What are your police sources telling you? You know, you're not the first person to ask me that question. <laughs> I'm not a real newspaper guy. You're the newspaper or the media experts, but I've got to tell you something. I've got enough common sense to know that if I say that, you know the expression that we all hate about newspaper? If it bleeds, it reads. You know, if you can get something exciting out there, they'll turn on your channel or they'll buy your paper. Uh, yeah, I know you can't get excited about it, but at the same time, you better be accurate when you say something because somebody out there is going to sue you if you're inaccurate, okay? Uh, there, there aren't too many people that are close to, the, uh, to that moment, that, that situation, that at least they don't believe they believe they know who did it. 
but the crime lab won't agree with them. But they don't agree with them by saying, it wasn't Mary, it was Joe, because that's what we really want to know, that Joe did it, right? Until somebody can prove that that's the person that torched the place, I'm not going to print it. Uh, you're not suggesting that I should, should print uh, suspicions. I know that, I know that. But, but I'm very cautious about that. Uh, not too many people, uh, this is, I guess it's supposed to be funny, uh, not too many people were closer to that fire than me. When Mary Lee and I came down, after my brother had called me at four o'clock in the morning and said, you going? I said, what the hell are you calling me for at this time of night? He said, down to your office. I said, why? It's on fire. So we ran down. I saw you down there at seven in the morning. And we got down there. And we stood out in the middle of Central Street and we looked up and guess where the hose was pointed? Right through the window beside my desk, you know? Okay? And I sat right above the pizza oven. And other people sat above other structural parts of the building. But that doesn't mean that anybody down there started the fire. Maybe somebody was a pyromaniac or something. I don't know. Nobody can prove it. Well, that's a, that's a story there. Okay. Yeah. What's happened to the investigation? Well, yeah. I mean, it's a story. we did that. At one point, maybe we were we striving. Maybe we're John. Maybe we're too shy. <laughs> Eric Francis does a great job of covering yeah. all, everything in great detail in the courts. I I, I sense that the police blotter is uh, is sort of what they hand you, right? I, I... Ah, <laughs> I gotta tell the truth here. <laughs> yes, it is sensitive <laughs> question. Yes, it is, and it is a sensitive question. Yeah. Uh, we, Which is okay. It all depends on who the dispatcher is, because they're the ones that are supposed to gather this stuff. We aren't allowed to go and ask the local police department. And if Robbie Blish was sitting here and he's a buddy of mine, I'd still say this. We need to be more welcome at the police department or the fire department. Not so we can do dirt on somebody, but so we can get the facts. We're isolated. Um, is there an open meetings law? I mean, is there, a, is there an open records law in the state of Vermont that allows you to see police records? Because I have been a police reporter in my younger years, and you used to go down there, and they had to let you put your fingers on the little yellow cards and go through and look at the arrests. They had to let you under law of the state. And, and in Vermont, they have to as well. Uh -huh. Absolutely. That doesn't mean that we haven't done that and that we haven't ended up with some kind of coverage of, a, of an incident. But we had to flex our muscles to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Phil? I beg you ask a question. I just, I just wondered if... I'm sorry? Could you be define or clarify what does paper of record, which the Vermont standard is, right? What does that actually mean, you are the paper of record? When I... Municipality, when, when a town has legal notices that they want and need to get to the public, they go to a certain publication where there might be three they could go to. They opt for their own reasons to come to, in this case, us. Like, uh, like the Reading is a, is a community of record. Uh, we're the community of record for Reading and West Windsor and Woodstock. Then, uh, Phil, I have a question based on what we've been doing today, and that is, is there any way, or maybe you already have one, or some kind of a citizens group that could kind of meet right, sort of maybe irregularly with, with the paper and, and proffer some of these ideas and get some feedback? And, um, I mean, it might be sort of helpful just to have some of us feeding stuff to you, it might even include some news for all we know, but um, does that make any sense? It makes great sense, and for a fellow who sits up here or stands up here or whatever I'm doing, 
here and saying, I want your input, you know, I'd be silly to say, I don't have time or I'm not interested. That pleases me immensely that people are willing to do that. Where to find the time to do it is why we haven't done more of it. I've tried to do it by going to individuals from time to time. I just mean I have sources, you know, but I, I really do inquire and try to get people to make sure they trust me so that they can talk candidly. Um, I, I just, yes, it's a good idea. It has to be, it has to take place in a, in a simple enough way not to get too complicated, not to get so regimented that all the other stuff we have to take care of. So John, John has a question here. Yes, John. Yeah, we, we haven't gotten one of the basic facts. What's the circulation these days? Mm -hmm. He would do that, wouldn't he? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to answer the way I answer most people, but not you. <laughs> we print about, not about, it depends if we get a special supplement or something, we up the circulation that week. Uh, 4,400. Our pass along, this is research that we do, not every single year, I might add. Our research tells us that 4.1 people per edition read that particular newspaper. Okay? So, I guess. I can honestly say 16,000. But the actual uh, purchase of newspapers is 4,400. Yes. Yeah. And subscriptions? How many people subscribe? I should, you know, the Valley News was very good about that. She had some oh, great I information. So. Um, I'm, I'm trying to answer that. I, I'd like to answer myself, in fact. But, um, our circulation, our total circulation, has held solid in spite of the flood and in spite of the fire, and has inched forward. To be very honest about it, Karen, it's grown more with the E edition than with the print edition. Yes, I get that. Okay? Um, so the print edition is not uh, uh, bigger than it used to be? No. No. And how's your E-edition? The E-edition smokes it by three to one or four to one. And can it make any money? I think it was, maybe it wasn't one of these sessions earlier. We commented last week that the problem is, yeah. you know, everybody knows they've got to be on well, line, but uh, well, I, I it's was, hard to figure out how to make money on it. I was stupid enough to say, boy, you know, we're going to try something new with this E-edition stuff. Let's, does it cost us that much? Oh, that's interesting. Okay, let's sell it for 25 hours. Somebody said, no, everybody's going to, like, to electronic edition. Well, not editions, but you know, email and that sort of thing. I charge $40. They're probably right. You ought to also make the advertising a whole lot more expensive than it is in the e-edition. Probably. I don't know what your rates are, but the thing well, is, I'll tell you what we'll most, sure. most people get pennies on the dollar for um, advertising in, electronically, and that's not good because, it, because it's the same advertising as anything else. Mm -hmm. And you just said that you, you've got more subscribers in that area. Uh, our method uh, deserves a discussion beyond the time limit today, but uh, <clears throat> we came up with a simple formula of, well, let's add 20% 20, uh, 20 to the cost of, if a person runs an eighth of an ad or a quarter of a page or a half a page, you just charge them an additional, like, $20. Yeah. A surcharge. That's how much. Stupid. That was us. Stupid. <laughs> you do such an amazing job. Let's let it all try hard.